sorry about that. Okay, so let's try it again. Hello, my name is Matthias Kirschner. I work for Free Software Foundation Europe, and I'm here today to talk with you about the core values of software freedom. Before we start, I would like to get some feeling about the values here in this room of you. So I would like to ask you the question three. First, who here thinks that governments, uh, your government's military should not operate in other countries? Okay, thank you. Then the next question, who here thinks that it should be mandatory that you should be vaccinated? Okay. And now the last question, which is a religious question. And uh, I was told I shouldn't do that, but well, I still do it. So uh, who of you thinks that Emacs is the best editor or operating system? Okay. <laughs> I think there are some tendencies, but beside that it was quite diverse from what I saw here. So. When we talk about the values of a movement, it's good to look where this movement is coming from. So, in the beginning of computing, when you got a computer, you also got the source code. You could do with the software whatever you wanted to do. Nobody was there and cared what you do with it. Then, over the time, companies realized that they can make a profit by restricting the access to the source code and by restricting who can do what or what not. So, and this got established more and more. Till the, in the early 1980s, um, this restriction triggered the start of the GNU project and the creation of the Free Software Foundation. And they defined again what software users should be allowed to do. And they came up with this definition here, with those points. They said that every user of software should be allowed to use it for any purpose. That everybody should be allowed to study how it works and understand what those things are doing around us. And that you can share the software again with others, modified or not modified. And that you can always make improvements to the software, that you can change it. So they noted that down, a little bit like the defining what was the, uh, the, um, the normal uh, behavior before, explaining that's what they want to do. And they started uh, to write software and make sure that everybody gets software um, under, those, under those terms. Now, some time later, there were also other organizations. They also explained um, what software, sh uh, what, what users should be allowed to do. Um, it's 10 points. I can't remember 10 points, I can remember four points. In the end, it's the same thing. When you think about it, what is this? Some people call it a car, some people say it's a Mini, others say it's a BMW, some people might call it a vehicle or a computer on four wheels. However they call it, it's the same thing. It highlights different aspects of it. Certain values which are connected are highlighted higher, like the brand or what it does or how you would like to, uh, um, to be seen by others. And the same is true for those other terms which are around uh, free software. So you can say free software, you can say open source, Libre software, combine them. In the end, it's the same software I'm talking about here. So when I say free software in this talk, it's the same as when someone else is saying open source software. Oh. Most other people say open source software. So now there was this movement and they started to write software, uh, allowed people to use, study, share, and improve it. Now there were some people coming to this movement and they misunderstood some things. So one part was uh, often that people understood that in this movement we care about that the software is available for everyone without any costs, so that you can have creative software. And they thought that that's one of the, the values which is connected there. Everybody should get it without having to pay for it. So that's also why 
from time to time we get emails or people ask us, oh, there is uh, someone violating the principles of free software. They ask for money when you want to download it, so it can't be free software. Also in app stores, they say, well, if, if you have to pay for this app, it cannot be free software. I have to check uh, and find another app. The free software movement, it's not about money. You can make money with this software. You can share it with others. You can ask for money for that. You can also share with others, not ask for money for it. Give it away gratis. So the money part is nothing which defines the values of this movement. There are many people in here who make money with it. There are others who do it and don't want to have money for it. Now, other people um, thought that because some prominent uh, examples in free software are uh, handled by that, that every, um, with free software, everybody needs to be able to participate. And everybody needs to be able to become part of the group of people developing something so that you have an open development model. And uh, that's something which is sometimes happening with free software but you are not forced to do that. And there are many examples where this is not the case. So with free software, we don't tell people how they should develop the software and with whom they should do it. It's absolutely fine if you sit at home in your basement, you write software, you don't listen to anyone, don't pick up the phone. Uh, when someone wants to talk to you, you don't listen to them. And you ship the software, sell it to someone else, give them all the rights associated with it, the source code, and yes, it's free software. And it's absolutely fine to do that with free software. While on the other hand, it is also possible that there are 15 universities around the world um, which are developing software all together and uh, students can also participate, professors can participate, but the software says it's just uh, for academic purposes. So it's violating one of the other values, but it's an open development model. Also, uh, in free software, we see that sometimes those development models, they change. So people sometimes complain, uh, someone is violating the principles of, of the software freedom movement. They, uh, they published the source code before and now we haven't heard from them for six months. It's possible that people who develop free software, that they from time to time focus on other tasks and during that time they don't listen to others and they just do uh, they, they make sure they can ship a new product and during that time they don't listen to any feedback and they don't want to have anyone else in their group. And afterwards that might change again or they decide, yeah, that maybe they can uh, write better software if they don't uh, ask for feedback by others. That's all possible with free software. Free software is not deciding about the development model. Now, another thing that happened over the time was that people um, said that they or wanted to introduce other beliefs, other values to free software as well. So we saw before it was that you should be able to use, study, share and improve the software. And then there were others who said like, yeah, but there's one other thing we should add there to make sure that this is something which I, which I value. So one prominent example of this is that um, there were people who said that free software should not allow military uh, use by the military because we don't want that the software we are writing um, that this is used to kill people. And this, I, I picked this example because there was a lot of discussion about this in the in the free software movement. So, first of all, one of the questions which came up was. When there are people who want to kill other people, will they care about what values we have defined in our software licenses? So if someone is violating some other principles of human behavior, will they care about what we write down there? That was something which was questioned there if that's a useful, a useful tool to achieve that. The other question which popped up there was, what does it mean, military use? So, a pickup truck, is it military use? 
if you use free software in there. Can you use it when it says no, no military is allowed to use it? If you mount a machine gun on it, you will see many conflicts around the world where this is used similar to a tank. So how far will you go there? What, how, how, will you, how will you define this? It's a, dif a, a difficult question how far this is going. Does it also mean the company which is, uh, which is producing those cars is not allowed to use the software anymore? And so, so there are many challenges there to, to think about how, how to do this right if you want to accomplish it that, that this is not happening. And one other important thing which we realized in this debate was that depending on where you're coming from, you have a different uh, opinion about that. So there are countries where the military is mainly focused on firing guns, firing tanks, and so on. There are countries where the military is responsible in case of uh, uh, catastrophes, floods, fires. They, uh, I mean, at, when you see big burning uh, woods, uh, um, uh, forests, there might, the military might be uh, responsible for that. In some countries, the military is partly responsible for, for, um, for emergency uh, first aid uh, situations. So depending on where you're coming from, which, uh, what you experience, your opinion will also be different there. And there were also other debates. One other example here is that um, people said, like the question before, that soft, the software should just be used by people who are vaccinated or by companies who make sure that their employees are vaccinated. So someone um, thought that there is a, a health problem and maybe we can fix that in, inside free software as well. The question which came up with this example is then also mainly how much more power do we allow developers in comparison to users? How much uh, of their value system are they allowed to transfer to the users of the software? And that's a tough one because there are way more examples like this. And uh, there, there are examples which are very broad. They say, you are not allowed to do evil. You are not allowed to harm people. And uh, many, many more things about uh, labor laws, about environmental uh, issues, about animal rights, about nuclear power, about gen uh, genetic uh, engineering, and many, many things. So think about how this could, be, uh, how this could develop uh, in a world where you have so many different political beliefs, so many different polit uh, religious beliefs, uh, so many different uh, cultures where people were growing up, different education, what can happen there? And so one thing to consider here is as uh, free software programmers, um, we, we often like our licenses. And we, we also saw that by those licenses, we accomplish a lot in our sphere to enable users to use, study, share, and improve software in the area. The question we should ask ourselves is if for other beliefs we have, for other values we have, if this is also the right tool. If we should use the same hammer we are using to fix our problem for other problems we have in our society. Or if maybe there are other solutions to this, um, how we can influence laws, how we can change social norms, how we can change markets, or um, architecture in, in, some, in some areas. So that's something we should really consider if software licensing is the right tool for other beliefs we have. In the end, till now, the free software movement always came to the conclusion it's too tricky to add other things there. And over the time, growing more and more, it will not become easier because there are more beliefs in the free software community. So after 35 years, it becomes difficult to find another joint uh, value we have, which brings us back to the four freedoms I mentioned at the beginning, that they are at the moment the common base, the common values in the free software movement. So to explain that a bit more again, that every person 
around the world can use the software for anything without asking for permission. Everybody is allowed to do whatever they want to do with the software. And that's a big thing when you think about this because everybody here in the room, even if you're not lawyers, when someone asks you, can I use this software? You can say yes, absolutely sure, yes. If someone asks you, can I do this with the software? You can say yes, I'm absolutely sure. So everybody is allowed there to use it for whatever they want to do. That's not a common, that wasn't a common thing before and for a lot of other areas that's not common that everybody is treated equally. And it makes sure that the users of software, they have, they have some balance between them and the developers of the software. On the other hand, there's still the value that you should be allowed to, share, um, to study how this works. So everybody around the world is allowed to understand what the software is actually doing. Nobody is prevented from that. Nobody is forbidden to get education how this important technology is working. We don't keep stuff secret. We enable everyone here to, to learn this. And we are also allow everyone to share the software with others again. So when you fix a problem for yourself, you are not limited uh, how to help others around you. You can ask for money for that, but you can also give it to someone else who doesn't have money. So you can help someone who is in the need of also fixing a problem but cannot, wouldn't be able to afford it like you were able to afford it. So that's something which is deep in there in free software that you are always allowed to help others and to work together with others in solving problems. And you are always able to improve software. So every individual, every organization, every company, every government, they are not forced to use software like someone else intended them to do following the assumptions someone else decided, following the rules someone else decided for them. They are always able to change the software to fit their own needs. So my argument is that at the moment, those four freedoms, those define the values we have in the free software movement. And software freedom, it's one piece in the puzzle. So we have many problems in our society, or many of you see several different problems, and free software in a lot of those, uh, in a lot of those uh, issues is an important part in there. But it's not enough. So you have all those different things, free software is fixing one part of it, and is fixing this, I think, pretty good. So we always should think about if you want to enlarge that, or if you should stick also to some of our history to the Unix principle, have one thing which solves one problem and find other uh, tools to fix other problems. So when we look where we are with software freedom nowadays, there is still a long way ahead of us. There are many areas in our world, many regions, many uh, tasks where software freedom is not a default. There's a long way there for us to achieve it that all humankind can benefit from this. And if you compare that to other freedoms in our society, we are at the very early beginning. So think about the freedom of the press. How long were people fighting for the freedom of the press? It's hundreds of years now. And what is the situation? There are people, a lot of people think it's a good thing to have that. Well, let's ask about that, the general population about software freedom. Then there are many countries where you have, software, uh, you have freedom of the press, but it's, you are still struggling to exercise it in practice. And there are countries where you had it, but then it was removed again. And there are many countries where they never ever had the freedom of the press. So, and you have people who are actively working against it and removing it from, from people. So, if you compare this with software freedom, I'm pretty sure that the next decades 
we will have to work on this, we will need more people to work on this, like other freedoms where people work for and which are other important parts in this puzzle. So freedom of the press is also one piece of the puzzle. It doesn't fix all the problems people see. It fixes one thing and you need other, um, other pieces in the puzzle to, to um, live the life you envision to live. So I think it's important that when we, when we work on software freedom that we focus that we get not distracted too much about other issues around us. It's easy nowadays to be distracted about all other things. So there are so many problems everywhere around us. But again, the same as with the freedom of the press, like if you stop working for this because you also want to fix this and you want to fix another problem and you want to fix another problem, you will never achieve any progress with the core part of what you are working on. So, we need to focus on those, on those values which we have. And to give you an example here, I also have other beliefs besides free software. So, and uh, one strong belief I have is that uh, I'm, I'm active in a, a wilderness first aid uh, group and um, we are helping people to understand how, um, how to behave in emergencies. And I believe that uh, people should not seriously be injured or die because of the lack of proper training in this area. And I join a group which also values this and which wants to make a progress there. And I'm active there. Also, lots of them, they don't care about software freedom. They don't agree with me on my other values. So that's sometimes hard. <laughs> Um, you can imagine, I mean, you, you know this from other areas as well, when you are then forced to work a little bit differently because uh, people don't agree with you on, on other beliefs. But it's something which I think is important that when, when you are um, working in one group that you focus on the goals and the values of this group and in the other groups you focus on those other ones. So when we are in the free software movement, we should think about how many values do people have to agree with to be part of the movement and to help us to accomplish it that software freedom is the default. So how many things do you have to agree with? When we see the three questions at the, at the beginning and those three circles here, we, we have a smaller group here than we have now here in this room if we all have to agree on those. So. That's a challenge to think about what are those values for us and how will they develop in future. Will it be the, those four ones? Might we find others where we agree with? I don't know, maybe. Um, but one thing which is also important here is that there's a difference between the free software movement and groups active in software freedom, in the software freedom movement. So, there are groups which have more values than those four values I, I mentioned, than use, study, share and improve. So we as FSFE, we have other values as well. And uh, they define how we work. But they are not deducted from that we are a free software organizations, uh, organization. They are mainly coming from that we are Europeans, um, we uh, are used to certain laws, we grow up with social norms around us, with a certain education. Um, the, the people who founded the organization, they had certain values and, and talked about that a lot. So uh, that's something which is then also, of course, uh, something which is uh, inside an organization. Also, it might not be written down. Some part is written down in the constitution. Other parts, they are not written down. So that's true for all the other um, organizations working there. Some, they, they value um, other, um, uh, other things besides those, uh, the, the core values of, of software freedom. The thing which I think is important there is to think hard about when, when to split up. So when are there beliefs that you don't agree with? When do you have to split? And uh, so that's, that's a tough question because some values, they, they are very deep inside us and it's, it's tough to say like, uh, 
I still work with those other groups, with those other people. Also, they are completely different from myself and completely different from, from how I think we should, we should live. But, yeah, I, I would like to encourage you to, before you say, like, let's split, to think about if, if, uh, if this is really something where we have to split for. And, uh, or if we can agree that those are our core principles, there are other values which we also believe in, which we fulfill in other areas, which we work for in other areas, and which are not a block of us to still work together with many others to make sure that free software becomes a default. So I think that in the free software movement, we will become larger, way larger. And we, that also means that we will be more diverse, more diverse than we are now. We will need way more people around the world to get active in this. And it will happen. I'm sure about that. That also means that we will be challenged. And we need to continue to be respectful. And we might sometimes be even more challenged in this, on this regard to be respectful to someone else who has a complete other background than we have. And while doing that, I think it's important to focus and not get distracted with all those other beliefs around us, but focus on software freedom in this movement and care about the other beliefs in our other work. So that's my part. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions up here? I start there. Hello? Okay. So, uh, thank you for your talk. It was great. So, um, no system is perfect, right, from the beginning. Every system needs to change. And the same holds true for the uh, free software, let's call it like this, uh, rules that you um, showed, the 10 ones. Um, as the time goes by, we see that the free software um, is uh, threatened by some companies, by some licenses, and so on and so forth. Let's not be specific here. Um, I agree with you that do one thing and do that well. As an engineer, I think that's the right way to go. But we also need to think that we need to adapt uh, the, the rules that we have for what we want to achieve as the time goes by. So. Um, do you see that those 10 rules um, are sufficient and will be sufficient? Or do you think that at some point, once the um, attack patterns on the free software change, uh, we will have to adapt also? Thank you. I mean, I think we, we already adopted over the time. So there were some challenges. Which, uh, where there was some change there, like with uh, um, how to translate these uh, this, uh, values in, uh, to other technology. And there will, be, there will be challenges with that for, I mean, there, there are already challenges like with network services, where you have to think about how do you translate this in this area. And there are some, some price, and uh, could we maybe uh, also add something to our licenses to, to make that easier to to, uh, to counter uh, attacks in this area. There are also, also other uh, technologies when they are coming up, like uh, artificial intelligence. The question is like, what, what role is free software playing there? And uh, it's, it's possible that, I mean, you need to translate that and what it means. And it could also mean that, um, to, uh, that, that, that people have the same possibility as they had before with the other technology. Um, people, you need other freedoms as well. So, for example, you, you might uh, additionally, to exercise the same things you were able to do in the past alone with software freedom, you might need other uh, freedoms or other, um, um, other tools there as well, like with, with data, access to data and how that is handled. Um, I, I think that the situation like it was uh, 20 years ago is also on a, on a regulator level completely different for, for the government. Um, what 
what people are could could ask for or not there if if it's uh, if it's necessary because of technological change that in some areas government might also have to regulate to make sure that people can still exercise rights which were before just being given by by software freedom but i i think that a lot of that will not mean that the software freedom part will be enlarged but it's that we see that uh, as a society to to achieve certain goals we need to add other parts in the puzzle as well again. So, Thank you. Up here. Hi. Thanks for your talk. So I know since day one that free software is free as in freedom and not as in free beer. Okay. It's, uh, everybody that has spent some time has heard this at some point. But uh, very recently I had uh, a problem because um, so there is an add-on for Thunderbird, uh, which is uh, called Send Later, and uh, his it's free software, and his developer recently uh, put up a Kickstarter because he said that since uh, there is the change of APIs in Thunderbird, he needs to rewrite the add-on from scratch. And the problem that he was facing is that this needs time and the commitment that he can support only if he gets these donations. And he was thinking about uh, basically making this software non-free anymore because he wanted to put a license to use the software. And as a supporter of free software, uh, well, this was disappointing, but at the same time, I see the problem that this guy, is, that this guy has. Because he says, I, I maintain 10 plugins, uh, that are free software for Thunderbird. I need to do a lot of work and I have to find, and only a very small fraction of the people that are using uh, these plugins actually support uh, me through donations. And I have asked him, uh, if this campaign is successful, are you going to still make your uh, source code available? And he said, I, I would like to do that, but I fear that if I do that, somebody else will take the code and remove the licensing part, the re license required part, and publish it again uh, with a, another name, and so, and so this doesn't work, because then at that point I, I, will, I will not have an income and, and I cannot uh, continue doing this. So what should I tell to this guy to try to I give him uh, an answer because I want to that this software remains free, but I, I also understand that this is just a guy and it needs something to to buy food <laughs> and, uh, and that's it. I mean, it's, it's coming back to the, to the general question. There are lots of the things I explained here. I can understand this and I can see where this is coming from. I mean, if someone, if you are a pacifist, and you write software and then afterwards you see that other people are killed with your software, that's a problem for you. And there might be the situation where you have to decide what is more important for you, the values of software freedom or the value of uh, pacifism and that you say, I stop writing software which might be used for this. And you might decide that you uh, write proprietary software if you believe that with this you could, you could uh, rather accomplish that. The same thing like when you, when you had a business model and it worked at a certain time, then times are changing. I mean, we are at the moment facing this, this issue that uh, large uh, corporations are threatening some business model of smaller, smaller software companies and they try to, uh, to, to balance that and, and by adding uh, clauses to, to software licenses which make them proprietary. I can fully understand those companies. I mean, when, when you see that, uh, well, if that continues like that, <clears throat> the, the company will cease to exist, or my employees will be working for some of the other big companies or, or not, then that's a tough decision. And it's never that there are absolute values in, in our society. You always have to balance it. What is more important now for you? Is it, is it now in your situation, is it software freedom? Or is it maybe uh, at the moment uh, more uh, on, on uh, making sure that your family gets, uh, gets uh, enough, uh, enough food on the table or that you can pay your employees. And that's, that's for a lot of the cases that's, 
that's something you need to balance. And we have that in many, many other areas. <coughs> you can be in favor of one value, can, you can be in favor of the other value, and then you see, oh, they are conflicting. So you are in favor of freedom of movement. On the other hand, you are in favor of better environmental regulations. And then you see, oh, I cannot drive into the city because they say, you, with, my, with my diesel, I'm not allowed to do this. So there's always this balance you, you have to see. And, and in the end, I mean, what you, what you can help some people is to see if they can still make it work with free software in the situation, if it's possible to do this. Sometimes there might be cases where it's not for some time. Then it might balance again. It, there is another development and it's possible again to, to do it in a similar way. That, that's something which is something which is, which is changing all the time. And you, I mean, what you can tell a person is that you understand it. You can try to, to see how, 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 what solutions there are that you tell the users, well, I would like to do it for software, but if you don't give me money, I can't. So I can either make it proprietary or I can, I can make it, uh, uh, you can give me, uh, you can pay money for this. It could also happen the person makes a software proprietary and all the users say, well, I use the software because it was with software, so I will not pay uh, for the software uh, when it's now proprietary, so you might also not get any money. So th they are, that's all tough, tough des decisions. I think we're doing, we're doing quite okay on time. We'll do a few more. Yeah. One more here first. Thank you, Matthias, for a really compelling talk. I have a comment and a related question. Uh, the comment is, again, thank you for telling us that values can be in conflict with each other. As proponents of free software, sometimes we, as a community, can be accused of being too idealistic and be too strident in our values. So when they are in conflict, as the examples you said, uh, we need to be humble and always look for opportunities that some of our own values might be in conflict with other values. My specific question, in, which is related to that, is uh, you said uh, in the use category, everyone for any purpose without restriction, not read or agree with any terms. Uh, as somebody who contributes occasionally to free software, less so than you, I'm very concerned from a personal liability standpoint. And I like the liability part of MIT or Apache or all these licenses that say you may use it, but you may not sue me. What is your response if somebody takes my software, disagrees with that term, and then comes back at me with a lot of corporate money, which I cannot match, and say, well, I disagree with your no liability clause. I'm going to sue you anyways because your software caused me billions of dollars in loss. I need to make sure that the no liability clause, if anything, is enforced. So what do you say in response to your no, not read or agree with any term part? So I mean, that, that's something which courts already also had to deal with. And uh, from, from what I heard, uh, the cases I heard, the, um, the question there is, what have you done there? I mean, it's, you, you wrote a software with good intention and others are using it for something completely different maybe even, um, <clears throat> but you don't have any business relationship. You put the software out there, people were able to use it, so it's a present. And with present usually it works differently about liabilities. So. Um, if they use it for one purpose and you did not do something intentionally wrong, then I would say that most sane judges should say, well, that's okay. You, you are not responsible for that. Of course, that's something which, uh, which will happen in any other cases as well. If you, uh, you do something like you, you write an article and you think like we have freedom of the press and then someone comes like, I sue you because you violated another uh, another law we have or, the, or another value we have. So that's something which in the end it's uh, if you want to be in the safe side, don't write software. And because the same thing could also happen with maybe partly with proprietary software, with some proprietary software. So yes, it's, it's something which uh, again, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not isolated. The, the values we have here. It's embedded in, in a whole society with laws, with norms, with uh, uh, 
where, where there are challenges over, over the time, those are changing different, uh, um, different uh, level of how important certain values are for the society. And yeah, in, I think at the moment you, you would be pretty safe in most countries I know of, but yes, you, you can never be sure. Well, thank you very much for this very elaborate and well-argued uh, argument of the perfect is the enemy of the good. Now, following your argument, which is basically um, by limiting the, the set of values that we require others to share with us, um, we can include more people in our group, which makes us larger and stronger. Now, following this to the logical conclusion is uh, I arrive at, okay, let's limit it to the very, very core set, which in terms of licenses, lets me arrive at some BSD or MIT kind of license, which I don't really like to arrive at. So how do I, how do I resolve this and still arrive at, a, at more like a copyleft license like GPL, which does put more restrictions and, and requires more shared values than the other ones. So everything I said here can be accomplished with every free software license we have. So that's not about copyleft or non-copyleft. And I would also, when, when we think about this, I mean, it's someone some, sometimes brought forward as an argument that, uh, um, that copyleft is another restriction uh, to, to those freedoms or those values. I think it's, I mean, <coughs> The, the other examples I talked about, they are all outside of the, of the software area there. So they are about other values. What, what was accomplished or what, what is accomplished with, uh, with copyleft is that we try to protect those values over the time. And uh, that's something which in some cases might work, in others it might not work. But all, all, all of what I said, it's, it's not, not, not connected to copyleft or non-copyleft to um, a, a license which also includes some patent uh, clauses or not. That, that should all be possible with that. So did, did that answer your question? Or? I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, it's, it's one of the challenges before when, when, it was the, when there was the question about uh, um, will we ad adapt over the time? Yeah, copyleft is one of those things where uh, people thought about like how do we protect those values over the time? What can we do about this? And uh, they are already some kind of uh, going towards some corner cases. So if you add way more, it, it, it's getting problematic with those other values. But with this, as, as they were also very early in the movement, I, I would say that the general acceptance of those is is still quite okay. One more up there. Was that a finger for a question? Yes? No? Yeah? Oh. Any more? So well, that in that case, I would like to thank you all for being here. Um, we have a booth, uh, the FSME booth is in, uh, in the building K on level 2. I would like to thank all the supporters and donors of the FSME who enable our work. Please also support our work for software freedom. And uh, big applause to the organizers of the FOSTEM team and the volunteers here for making sure that we can all come here and share those ideas and have those discussions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.